In my opinion, Odin's connection to the Dionysian is the most obvious, especially when we examine the etymology of his name. His name means frenzy, the inspiration that guided warriors and poets alike. He is associated with magic and intoxication. Additional Germanic equivalents stemming from Wodaz encompassed Gothic, possessed. Old Norse Odur, mad, frantic, furious. Old English Wode, insane, frenzied. And Dutch Wode, frantic, wild, crazy. Accompanied by the substantive versions like Old Norse Odur, mind, sense, song, poetry, more Dionysian elements. Old English Wode, sound, noise, voice, song, or Old High German Wuat, thrill, violent, agitation, and Middle Dutch Wowet, rage, frenzy, all originating from the same root as the initial adjective, Proto-Germanic expression Woden, madness, fury, and Wojanen, to rage, are also inferable. Philologist John D. Fries has posited that the Old Norse gods Odin and Odur were likely initially linked, as seen in the doublet Ulur Ulian and Odur Wodaz, being the more ancient form of the fundamental origin of the name Odin, Wodanus. He further proposed that the deity of fury, Odur Odin, was juxtaposed against the deity of splendid grandeur, Ulur Ulian, in a way akin to the Vedic differentiation between Varuna and Mitra. That dualism between Varuna and Mitra, as I compared earlier to Apollo and Dionysus, is relevant to Odin. In fact, I would argue that Odin is almost a perfect synchronization between a Dionysus and Apollo. Like Apollo, Odin is associated with prophecy, fate, justice, and order. Hugin and Munin are a pair of ravens that fly all over the world, Midgard, and bring information and messages to and from the god Odin. In the Greek legends, ravens are messengers of Apollo and are symbols of Apollo's prophecy. Herodotus says that Apollo is the most worshipped by the Hyperboreans, Germans, and Odin also has obvious Dionysian side that he's the frenzy god who gives inspiration. And as I mentioned, the connection with Saturn and Dionysus, Odin has even more Saturnian aspects to his character. Saturn, like Odin, is the All-Father who rules from the underworld, who gave the world the Golden Age before he was sacrificed by Zeus for mankind and plays a central role in myths about creation and destruction of the world. Saturn's return marks the end of the age and the beginning of a new. Odin checks every one of those boxes. He is the All-Father, connected with creation, the end of the world, and his death, like Saturn, makes him a judge of the dead. Of the Gauls, Julius Caesar writes that they claim descent from Dispater, the Roman underworld god, who was actually Tyrannus. The Dispater connection brings us all the way back full circle to Dionysus, Osiris, and Hades. And the Dispater of the Celts is also dual nature, with Chthonic and Skyfather traits, like an Apollonian Dionysian duality. Before I bring this back to Dionysus, I have to address Odin's common equivalence with Mercury, which I think is a bad one to one equivalence that so many people make. Julius Caesar also wrote, Among the gods, Mercury is the one they principally worship, when referring to the Germanic tribes east of the Gaul. Tacitus cites Caesar two centuries later, writing his Agricola, refers to the god Odin as Mercury, Thor as Hercules, Tyr as Mars, and Isis, Freya. And the old Roman day for Wednesday at the time was Mercury's day. So when the Germanic lands became more Romanized, they converted this day to Wednesday or Woden's day. This is not without any merits though. 
Tacitus did have some good reasons for this. Odin is a messenger like Mercury, who also has the role of a psychopomp who transports the dead to and fro the underworld. We see this with Thoth of the Egyptians. Like Mercury and Thoth, Odin is also the god who gave mankind the runes or the runic alphabet. And in the Greek and Egyptian myths, it's Hermes, Mercury, or Thoth that gives mankind alphabets and hieroglyphics. You can argue that Odin has traits of Saturn, Mercury, Apollo, and Dionysus, and possibly influenced by all of these, since Odin comes much later in history. There are some who think Odin's imagery, riding a horse with a spear flanked by two birds, compares to the ancient depictions of the Dacian and Germanic gods, who also have similar depictions, and they use this to argue that Odin must be much older. However, in my opinion, this just brings us right back to Dionysus, via the depictions of Thracian Zalmoxus and Phrygian Sabasius. We clearly see that Zalmoxus and Sabasius are also depicted with riders of horses, with spears flanked by birds. To me, it's more obvious that Wodanus, or Frenzy, is a title that became evolved into a name, coming from Sabasius of the Phrygians and the Thracians. The symbol of Sabasius was the eagle. But where exactly did Sabasius come from? And how old is Sabasius? Even the earliest mentions by Greek sources back in the 5th and 6th centuries BCE, Sabasius was referenced as a god of the Thracian or Phrygian in origin and was recognized as being profoundly ancient even in those times. In Athens, his cult was notably associated with the Orphic and Eleusinian mysteries where nocturnal initiation rites were conducted and initiates underwent purification through mud application and intoxication. Participation involved a sacred beverage, which was a psychedelic wine mixed with ergot called kaikion. These are known as ethnogens, Greek for ethnios and genestai, which means full of the god or filled with the god. The adjective entheos translates to English as full of the god, inspired and possessed, and is the root of the English word enthusiasm. The correlation between Sabatios and Dionysus, consistently noted in Hellenistic documents, is irrefutable. In the Orphic hymns, he is noted interchangeable with Dionysus. Nonetheless, inscriptions from Phrygia link him to Zeus, and in North Africa, where his worship is documented as early as the 4th century BCE, he might have been perceived as a celestial deity, leading to his eventual association with the Semitic god Yahweh, with both receiving the Greek title Theos Hypsistos, God Most High, or El Elyon, to revisit this Chaldean oracle. Dionysus, or Bacchus, was called by the Chaldeans Ya'o, in the Phoenician tongue and is frequently called Saboeth, such as the one who is above the seven poles, called Demiurge. It should be noted that the three-letter Greek rendering of Yahweh, Ya'o, is exactly how the Old Testament god of the Septuagint is spelled, and he is frequently mentioned in the Greek magical papyri as the highest god. Plutarch, in his Symposiacs, argues that Yahweh is some eastern form of Dionysus. While I would admit that a one-to-one -one comparison is preposterous, I do think that both Greek Dionysus and Hebrew Yahweh have common elements in their ancestry from the Bronze Age. Here's what Plutarch says. The time and matter of the greatest and most holy sovereignty of the Jews is exactly agreeable to the holy rites of Bacchus, for that which they call the feast that they celebrate in the midst of vintage, furnishing their tables with all sorts of fruits, while they sit under the tabernacle made of vines and ivy, and the day which immediately goes before this they call the day of tabernacles. Within a few days after they celebrate another feast, 
not darkly, but openly, dedicated to Bacchus. For they have a feast amongst them called Crediphoria, from carrying palm trees, and Thriceforia, when they enter into the temple carrying Thrice. What they do within I know not, but it is very probable that they perform the rites of Bacchus. The first may be drawn from their high priest, who, on holidays, enters their temple with his meter on, arrayed in skin of hind embroidered with gold, wearing buskins, and a coat hanging down to his ankles. Besides, he has a great many little bells hanging at his garment, which make a noise as he walks the streets. This is agreeable to the Eleusinian priest. If you look into the claims here, Plutarch is actually right. The city of Pompeii was destroyed by a volcano during the eruption in 79 AD, and everything found there is clear archaeological evidence of the culture that predates that eruption. It's like a perfect time capsule. Found within the digs at Pompeii is a painting of Eleusinian Hierophant, who is a high priest of Dionysus and Demeter and he is portrayed identical as Plutarch says, which is also identical to that of the Levite priest, but described biblically from Exodus 28. Now the high priest has a special ephod and coat that goes to one man, but the other Levites are to wear what is described nearly identical to those of the Eleusinian hero plants. White robes, gold and blue and purple coats. Have them use gold and blue purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen, Exodus 28. Make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth, with an opening for the head in its center. There shall be a woven edge, like a collar around this opening, so that it will not tear. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe, with gold bells between them. The gold bells and the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe, Exodus 28. It is entirely possible that both the Levites and Hierophants are passing down a common tradition of a standard high priest garments, of an ancient tradition that the Bacchic and Judaic are both related to. I mentioned earlier that Pompey the Great had a coin made in memorial of his conquering of Judea that read, Bacchius Judaeus. Some think that this is a name of a person that was beaten by Pompey. Tacitus, however, says that Pompey went into the Holy of Holies and found nothing except a golden ivy diadem that Dionysus is known for wearing in his legends. Some might be wondering then, what about the second book of Maccabees, which says, Moreover, at the monthly celebration of the king's birthday of the Jews, from bitterly necessity, had to partake of the sacrifices. And when the festival of Dionysus was celebrated, they were compelled to march in his procession, wearing wreaths of ivy. I think the Dionysus of the Greeks is so far removed from any Dionysian elements that we find in Judaism, they are no longer even remotely the same deity. And to me, this is more of a political issue. When the Romans had their own version of Dionysus, Liber Pater, or Free Father, in Latin, and we know that he is present in the Aventine in 496 BCE, when Alice Posthumus vowed the sacred games in his name. However, a group of Bacchans from outside of the Roman cult was still outlawed in 186 BCE due to its political and social problems that it caused from the Senate. Same God, opposing priesthoods, that brings problems. In fact, Antiochus Epiphanes, who is the one that 2 Maccabees says installed the procession of Dionysus in Jerusalem, also seems to find something interesting. Manasius of Petre wrote that Antiochus Epiphanes raided the temple in 164 BCE and found a golden statue of a man riding a donkey. This imagery would immediately remind anyone in that time of the image of Dionysus, who was frequently depicted as riding a donkey and in the play Frogs by Aristophanes, he rides into Athens 
on a donkey before he descends into the underworld. Valerius Maximus wrote about an event that happened in Rome regarding the Jews being kicked out of the city. Gnaeus Cornelius Hispulus, Praetor Praeriginus, in the year of the consulate of Marcus Populus, ordered the astrologers by an edict of to leave Rome and Italy within ten days. Since by a fallacious interpretation of the stars, they protrude fickle and silly minds, thereby making profit out of their lies. The same Praetor who compelled the Jews, who attempted to infect the Roman custom with the cult of Jupiter Sabasius, to return to their homes. Here we see that the Romans were equating Yahweh with Jupiter Sabasius, probably due to its similar customs and rites. There is a certain Nisa, mountain high, with forests thick of cedar in Phoenicia afar, close to Egypt's streams. It is conjectured that the Romans identified the Jewish Yahweh Savaot as or Jove Sabatios. This could be just a mishandling of the linguistics, but it could also mean that Sabasius and Sabaoth were already related in some way. Sabasius in Thrace and Dacia, as well as the Scythians, had multiple local appellations of Sabasius, including Athiparenos, Arcelanos, Batalde Awanos, Elenites, Mytorginos, Orzelanios, and Tasabastinos. All these different gods from different locations in the Scythian world show undeniable links to Sabasius and Dionysus. These are all frenzy gods and vegetation gods. And this shows how widespread Dionysus was in his ancient Bronze Age religion. I think the evidence is overwhelming and undeniable. Evidence of a great mother figure in Phrygia is found in archaeology, dating back to 6000 BCE. Notice this is a Stone Age depiction of a goddess guarded by two lions. The same image of Kybele shows up in later Greek and Roman era, also sitting as a queen flanked by two lions. And we even have a transitional form of this goddess. In the Bronze Age, she is known to the Hittites as Kubaba, considered by them as the most ancient and holiest. These Hittites also depict her with Sabasius, although his name may have been different at that time. But he is still the frenzy god, surrounded by Bacchants, dancing and holding ivy wreaths. Again, illustrating how ancient this religion was. The Phrygians kept this image of her, and she is later adopted by the Roman Republic in the same image flanked by these lions. Considering the fact that the cultivation of grapes was discovered in this very region of the world around 6000 BCE, contemporary with this figure of Kubaba or Kybele, makes it possible and likely to me that a vine god was also born here. It is commonly thought.